uh, just to start, I mean, I just wanted to, again, officially now, on, you know, uh, in the record, thank you for, for joining us and uh, all the, the references you sent us beforehand, they were all so interesting and we were really excited to, to have you over. And as I told you, I mean, feel free to, to use the time here, whatever way you see fit, you, uh, if you want to uh, just go over a presentation and discuss, or if you want to bring people in as you go, it's fine. We usually take like a short break, one, one hour in, just so people can take a breather. But other than that, uh, yeah, just the, the floor is yours and we can, we can go. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for having me. Um, it's a real honor and, and a pleasure to meet all of you. Um, so yeah, I so yeah, I guess to introduce myself. Um, and I'm Amelia uh, Davenport. I I write um for Cosmonaut Magazine, and I've been on a number of podcasts uh, with them. And um, we in Cosmonaut, one of our goals is to make socialism scientific again, right? To really engage with what it means to have a scientific socialism that isn't just like. And it a kind of an ideological fetish. And so, and that takes a lot of forms. Um, but one of the things for me that's really important personally is looking at organization science and the way in which um, we can have empirically verifiable and kind of rigorous um, ways of approaching um, organizations as formal systems and, and informally um, and then and, and figuring out how to apply these things in, in, in um, practical organizing. And so um, the, the kind of the thinkers that I draw the most from are uh, Stafford Beer, um, Alexander Bogdanov, um, Mary Parker Follett, and um, John Boyd. Um, and John Boyd is a, an American military theorist. Um, he was an Air Force colonel, but he's mostly influential on the US uh, Marine Corps. Um, he's not very influential in the Air Force at all, actually. But, um, but all these thinkers, from Bogdanov and Beer and Boyd and, and Follett, they all are systems thinkers. And they um, look at the way in which um, there are um, invariant structures that exist across different types of organizations, whether they're social, um, biological, or um, in, in, a, in, a, um, in a ecological. Um, and how you can observe um, common analogical dynamics um, between them. And so um, like Stafford Beer is, is, is yeah, very um, helpful for, for this, but um, I wanted to talk mostly about this thinker, um, Eliyahu M. Goldratt, who was a business um, consultant um, and he developed what's called the theory of constraints. And um, the theory of constraints um, essentially to really boil it down is this idea that in any type of um, process that is goal oriented um, when you're working and, and, and has repeatable steps to, to achieve your effectiveness at reaching the goal is defined by um, the segment of the process that um, is the least efficient or the, the, um, the slowest or the, um, it, it's it, the acts as the constraint to the whole system. And so traditionally in Western management from Frederick Taylor up to the 1980s, um, you kind of had two approaches to um, how to deal with management. One was that you wanted to control cost and um, increase output, uh, pretty straightforward. And you wanted to do that um, through maximally um, engineering and finding the one best way um, is which is a term a term from Frederick Taylor for how to engage in these industrial processes or, or work processes um, and you would maximally optimize every single process reduce waste at every single process um, and if you did that you would have the best system possible um, and the alternative was what comes from it comes from Elton Mayo um, is the human relations movement and it was a critique of, of this sort of dehumanizing, um, seeming process of, of reducing people to machines or whatever. Um, uh, and it was, you know, very human centric and very dealt with the psychology and, um, you know, how do you make people have buy-in and make them feel, um, they belong. And they, they seemed like they were opposed, but both of them kind of served to reinforce one another, um, in different aspects of the industrial process. But the, um, the main thing though is, um, <clears throat> 
it, it ended up causing continual crises in capitalism where you had um, huge accumulations of inventory and um, lots of disruptions all along the um, the chain of production processes and, and, and supply chains because each process had created a local optima where you would overproduce um, and then uh, often underproduce or like you would have things stretched to the limit. And so there was no room and, or um, buffers for uh, variation where it was needed. But so you'd end up with um, like tons of materials in one area and even though they weren't needed and not enough in another area. And, and these are the same problems you see in the uh, Soviet economy, right? Where you had huge gluts in um, say steel production, but um, at the end point of where that steel production was actually needed for the consumer um, or even for supplying the factories that produce steel, um, you would have shortages and this constant variation. Um, and so um, Gold Rat's theory of constraints allows us to look at the, the uh, broader perspective and, and look at the whole system of the production flow and develop like a, an analysis of the value stream um, which is like, how do you deliver, um, they call it value, not something Marx's sense of value, but how do you deliver like use values to the end point? Um, and in this sort of pro framework, it, do it doesn't just apply to manufacturing. It also applies very well to say um, organizing um, as long as you have consistent um, and regularized um, organizing processes in, in your actual say like labor union work or um or whatever, because like you end up with um, you know channels of communication and regular activities like um, one on ones or um, you know agitational activities and, and and meetings, those sort of things. And in you can look at um, the way in which um, you can identify where you actually have your constraints and like where your process is actually limited. Um, but one of the things that's really important in Goldratt's um, framework is that you don't want to just continually abolish your constraints and overcome them. You actually want to use your constraints to set the, the tenor of your organization process. Because at some point, um, when you abolish a constraint, you end up with a new one and, and it, you don't necessarily know where it is, but you have these um, fluctuations in your, in your process where um, you can um, waste effort and waste time or um, alternatively stretch things to, um, and stretch people past their limits. Um, if you don't figure out where your constraint is and, and what he calls elevate it. And so use it to um, identify where in your, um, like wh what time you actually need to do a step. Um, you know, in um, manufacturing, which is kind of in the, the examples he uses and it's a little easier to think about, um, it used to be that you had efficiency measured by like the output of an individual workstation or machine. And so like how many um, widgets this machine produces per hour um, determines its, its rate of utilization and whether you're getting your money worth for it as a capitalist. But that's actually really wasteful because you end up with like a huge inventory of widgets and in, in the next step down on the process isn't actually using them. And so you're spending all this resources that um, you don't actually need to and so you're accumulating all this inventory and eventually like maybe those widgets go out of date or you know become um unusable or you know you're just holding all this as capital as as inventory but in organizing you know we don't have the luxury of wasting resources and so it, it can be very helpful to think about like well why am i doing this process um when like it's not necessarily needed right now, right? Um, when do you need to actually um, engage the the steps of your your organizing workflow? Um, and then there's lots of tools to help with this. Um, there's um, like Kanban boards, which come out of uh, Toyota um, um, kind of manufacturing process, but you can help you visualize your workflow and. Um, I think that it's it's very helpful to think about um, yeah the the goal in terms of um, breaking things down and making it so you can understand um, the, the operations of structure you're trying to study, whether it's your own system or a system you're trying to disrupt as um, a sequence of, um, of real connections and um, that achieve a result. Um,
I don't know. Um, I guess do you want to pause here? I, I don't know if I'm going kind of if this is helpful or um, I could pivot to Barry Follett, but I mean, or if there's any questions people have or. Cool. Um, so Mary Follett um, also engages with these sorts of problems, but from a very different perspective, she, um, I didn't assign or give you guys her readings that they're a little bit, the language is a little difficult because she's writing in the turn of the century, um, you know, sort of like Marx or whatever, but she was a originally political scientist who, um, became a social worker um and she's a part of this great american tradition of like lesbian socialist um social workers there's a, there's a number of them um mary van cleek is, is another great one but um mary parker follett she um worked in um kind of community organizing and developed like some youth programs but she she was meeting with all these business leaders and she realized that they were actually like really effective at um organizing it but they were also engaging with philosophical problems that um she had been grappling with as like a political philosopher and so she, she ends up drawing on like sigmund freud and uh behavioral psychologists um like watson um and um the gestalt psychologists and who she had she had really studied their work and then alfred north whitehead um who was a collaborator Bertrand Russell um, to develop this theory of, of integration. And so integration is um, the sort of dialectical approach to social problems. Um, Follett believed that in social organizations, you have um, this recurring theme, which she called power over. And power over is this dynamic in which um, individuals try and impose their will onto other individuals and um, to achieve their goals, whether they're safe for the greater good or, or whatever, but they have this sort of fight attitude and it's either one wins or the other wins. Um, Follett came to believe that um, there was another approach, which she called power with, um, in which um, the interests of different sections of an organization could achieve their actual objectives um, cooperatively um, and create a higher order um, uh, level of coherence in which they subordinate themselves to, to achieve their kind of lower order um, goals. Um, and so Follett proposes that um, rather than um, trying to um, approach things like, you know, I have my perspective and these things I want to achieve and you have those and we're going to try and compromise. She, she said like, this is not the, the way that, to do things because you both lose in a compromise. And so rather than that, um, to lay out and, and analyze. And, and so this sort of goes back to sort of the, the gold rat, I guess, with the sort of breaking things down, but to break down um, the different interests and stakes that both parties have um, in, in this conflict and to figure out together a, um, a process for investigating how to and, and agreeing on how to figure out how we're going to solve these problems together or how we're going to resolve this and um, to combine the elements in which you have um, like the, the core interests of, of both parties into a new solution. And so, you know, one example that she gives in her writing is, it's kind of superficial, but um, she was in a library and she wanted like some fresh air in the library. And so next to her was this window, but also right next to the window was a, a, a man who, he didn't want the window open because it would rustle his papers and he was you know trying to, to write and study. And, and, you know, the compromise in that situation would be to just lift the window part way, right? But that would rustle his papers a little bit and not give her the air she really needed. And so rather than that, um, they together looked around and they realized there was a window like, you know, a little ways away that when they opened that, that created enough airflow for her. And so didn't rustle his papers because it was far enough away from him. 
And it allowed for the sort of process of like taking a step back and investigating the situation. Um, and so she has this other concept called the, the law of the situation, which I personally find very helpful in um, organizing work. Um, and which is basically that um, in traditional hierarchical organizations, you have the, the leader, you know, maybe gives an order and says, this is the way to do things. And that makes someone feel like shit, you know, uh, if they're um, being given that order. So instead, um, and even if they're right, you know, so instead what she proposes is that a leader poses a problem for um, the subordinate um, person, quote unquote subordinate, and together uh, or with the leadership of the subordinate person, they identify the, the way to resolve this problem. And so by enabling the subordinate person to come up with this and engage in this in the scientific or critical process of determining the course of action um it creates an authority which is the situation's authority right it's the it's the problem having to be solved rather than the will of either party um that um allows for um both parties to have a stake in, in solving it and the function of the leader becomes one of accountability rather than one of authority. And so it's the the fact that the, you know, the, the senior person um, gets the agreement of the other person to do the thing that they came up with themselves or came up with together that becomes their role rather than um, to like do all the thinking. And in this process, you end up distributing um, the cognitive load in a way that's much more effective. And also it allows for the um the the more junior person to um develop themselves and you know um use the information that they have because people who are engaged in a process tend to have better information about the situation than somebody who's more removed um and this goes is very helpful for thinking about say a military theory with um john boyd's um theories of um conflict and he talks a lot about this thing called um Alfred's tactic which comes from the german military theory like prussian military theory which is um, mission tactics and it's the same idea that fallout has of the law situation but essentially in the, in the prussian military um they really emphasized um the autonomy contrary to kind of um um stereotypes they really emphasized the autonomy and initiative of junior officers and um, the senior officer would give a, a priority and a, and a goal, but the junior officer is actually the one who came up with the tactics for achieving the goal, for achieving the mission. And the senior officer's role was evaluating and maybe giving advice, but ultimately it was the, the junior officers who are um, responsible for developing based on their local observations and analysis of the situation for how to achieve these higher level priorities. Um, you know, which is a much more effective use of the cognitive resources of an organization um, than having a, a cadre or a clique of senior leaders um, developing this. And so when you think about um, the whole theory of constraints and the way in which you have this constraint theory, these are, it sort of depersonalizes um, the process of um, analyzing the efficiency and effectiveness of a system. And you take Follett's approach to um, depersonalizing these problems through like dialogue and through um, um, integrating different perspectives um, and, and emphasizing the importance of local information, um, but also the benefits of expertise that a senior, more senior person and experience they have to help advise, um, but rather than command, um, you end up with a way in which you can train people in these broader systems perspectives uh, that say Goldrat has um, with this sort of um, more comradely approach to um, uh, organizing and, and, and in the concrete implementing these ideas. Um, and so I think that this is, it's very interesting that it's bourgeois theorists who are developing this, right? Um, and it, but what it really rhymes a lot with um, Alexander Bogdanov's 
theories of technology, right? Where he's talking about, and in Bogdanov, you have this idea called the law of the least, um, which is exactly the same idea as Goldratt's theory of constraints. And Bogdanov uses the law of the least, which is the idea, like the crude way, he says, you know, the crude way to put this is the uh, chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Um, or, you know, um, the a fleet of ships only moves as fast as its slowest ship. And so when you talking about like say the soviet economy bogdanov critiques the soviet economy because they really overemphasized um heavy industry right at the exclusion of light industry and in other areas and so you end up with this imbalance that causes chronic delays and shortages um all on the way because as much as steels are producing they don't actually have to the equipment to ensure the steel's high quality right so you're wasting tons of steel um but Bogdanov approaches these issues a little differently than um, Follett or Goldratt, because Follett and Goldratt both assume, um, and Follett is, is kind of a socialist. She calls herself a socialist, but she's she's really a liberal, and doesn't um, it, she's a, doesn't really care for class class struggle, right? Um, she she does think that it's real, but both Follett and, and Goldratt um, they see the unity of these systems as a priori and that it's the division is false where Bogdanov recognizes class struggles as primary and he emphasizes the way in which that like it's only in communism in a society without classes that you can have um the interests of society align in such a way that divisions are maybe more ephemeral um or maybe to use the Maoist kind of framing, um, are non-antagonistic or whatever. Um, but one of the other kind of really interesting things about sort of the differences here is Bogdanov has a very um, maybe Promethean attitude. Um, it, he really emphasizes the way in which like mankind can, you know, master its own destiny and, and those sorts of things. And we're fall at um she's much more um pensive about these sorts of ideas and she really emphasizes actually like the importance of, of nature um and so and like the way in which um we shouldn't try and dominate nature we should um collaborate with nature right um and i think this kind of comes from and well traditionally like you know it's using nature as a resource and cheap is kind of a very bourgeois idea but paula is generalizing this idea of the sort of the win-win right the idea that everybody can everybody can win um and and gold rat sort of has the same idea that you know um the workers will get taken care of if we make this system more efficient because it's actually in the interests of the capitalists to ensure people have a decent pay or whatever like you know henry ford did or whatever um maybe there's a rational self-interest there but i think both of them are very naive in that capitalism inherently has these um disequilibrating and competitive dynamics that really prevent um these sorts of things they're observing um from happening um and from being generalized to whole society where you know bogdanov sees the potential for the planned economy um goldratt even though the theory of constraints very he actually explicitly in one of his talks which is called beyond the goal it's a series of lectures he talks about the way in which this applies to supply chains on the global level he basically throws up his hands and says it can never actually be coordinated at that level like you just got to deal with it um he never takes that leap um because both he and fall don't want to upset the established order they don't want to get rid of the accumulated property you know fall says everybody can be better off we don't have to touch the the wealth that people already have it um and I think that that's, you know, it's, it's very naive because like, I don't think it, it, it misunderstands the point of this capitalist system. And so like the capitalists are willing to use these sorts of systems perspectives locally um, and op create local optima um, because they are effective in certain ways. But when you try and turn that gaze um, to areas they don't want you to, it really gets shut down very quickly. Um, like you see in in chile with um stafford beer's work um at cybersen you know it was an existential threat to 
global capitalism to allow um, these sorts of systems approaches to be applied to the economy there and, and have that be a, kind of a showcase of um, where this is working. Um, they actually, the U.S., um, like there's um, like documents that have been like Freedom Information Act requested that show that like the CIA was existentially afraid of the Soviets ident- developing cybernetic um, planning because they, with like um, this Victor Glushkov and, and uh, Anatoly Kitov's work in developing Ogosh and um, earlier attempts to automate and in- net- create networked communication in their economy because they they realized that from the, their own projections and their own understanding of cybernetics that it would have allowed the Soviet economy actually to leapfrog the U.S. Um, had these investments been made and had the sort of decentralizing approach um, to organization been fully implemented. Um, and so there was, a, there was a huge effort by the West to prevent a socialist economy from being able to develop these things um, because it, yeah, it, it, they, they realized that like their own system has these recurring crises and that, um, and they think it's fine because, you know, there's a, there's a creative destructive role of this, but um yeah the, so like there's this sort of um this tension there um that the capitalists really don't want the global option to be created um because it, it would undermine their ability to locally accumulate um but i think that's um the kind of gist of my monologue but if we maybe want to move into a, a dialogue format Anyone wants to start? Uh, yeah, I can start. Um, so thank you, Amelia, for that excellent um, overview of all of these things. I, I was really um, amazed by this book uh, by Goldrod, and also everything you're saying is like an extremely good. Like I, I'm, I definitely need to uh, research a lot of these different avenues here. Um, but I, I was wondering. I had two questions. One regarding uh, the work of Eleanor Ostrom. I, I don't know if you're familiar with her work, but I was wondering, because uh, one thing that you said kind of triggered the thought about Ostrom, which is about how, you know, it's almost like when you say in, in a socialist environment, we could kind of do away with certain um, assumptions about the, the the nature of the environment such that, you know, some of these extra costs wouldn't have to be incurred. Um, I feel like that's that's kind of akin to Ostrom's idea that you have um, extra, you, you have to spend some energy or it costs something in order to enforce property laws. Um, and in order to, to create a, a system more akin to socialism or environment, a socialist environment, uh, you would suspend that need for po- basically policing resources, um, and that would free up, you know, this wider world of organizational science. But but because we live in a capitalist world, we have more of an adversarial relationship towards each other's property and, and resources and so on, and um, so we have to pay this extra cost. And and Austin tries to find a way in between, right? She's neither. She tries to find a way that's neither state enforced, right, which she kind of associates with socialism. So that's why she's not socialist herself. Um, and, and she also kind of has an implicit critique of, of uh, market driven ways of organizing. Um, and then my follow up question to that. So what is your opinion on Ostrom is the first question. And the second question is like this theory of like firms in capitalism as being islands of command so like within the firm itself they don't actually organize using money or or competition per se but they actually organize more of a top-down like um you know command structure um and i know you you brought up like decentralization and the law situation and, and things like that so um but i was it was interesting because it's it's like when you look inside companies, that's where you find this like very quick evolution, very quick development of organizational science. Uh, so like how would we as 
you know, organizers or we as um, trying to fight capitalism, how, how would we match that level of, of organizational development? Um, yeah, so those are my two questions. So I haven't read Ostrom's main book myself. I've, I've heard a, a lot of, about Ostrom. I was supposed to have read her for a class that I just read the cliff notes for. So like, I'm familiar with, with, with some of her stuff, but like, I will be honest, I, I, I just like didn't actually do the reading uh, when I was supposed to for that. Um, a bad student. Uh, my, my patron saint is Ignatius of, of Loyola because he's the patron saint of bad students. But um, I linked a paper um, in the chat, um, which is really interesting because it talks about the way in which almost 30% of American workers are employed in some form of what they call guard labor, which is like some form of property enforcement. Um, you know, whether there's literal security guards or like if their work is oriented around like compliance or, or these sorts of things where it's basically about protecting property. And that's pretty crazy. Like a, a third, almost a third of the American workforce is engaged in this sort of superfluous labor that very clearly wouldn't have to exist in a system without property. I mean, some of it might like, you know, if you have very scarce resources that are very important or something, um, you know, or there's like water shortages or something, you probably have the people to make sure that people don't abuse the water supply or something. But that that's much more negligible than this massive system of like that we, property enforcement we have in, in the market economy that's like spiraling really out of control. Um, but I, I think that um, I think that there's truth to the idea that um, you know, it does take a lot of energy to to enforce these the market competition, but at the same time, there's this really great um, systems ecologist um, Howard T. Odom. I mean, he's got problems of his own, and he's very um, bourgeois, like Malthusian or whatever, like for kind of a population control guy. But he talks about um, this called Emergy. Then we actually did a podcast on him recently for Cosmonaut. But energy is the idea of embodied energy and the amount of energy it takes to, it took to create something or establish something. And so like city internet has a certain amount of energy it took to create that and it, it offsets, you know, energy to have the, the internet, but um, all the energy that goes into the internet is embodied energy or like all the energy that it took to deliver a hot dog to the vendor um, on the street from you has a certain amount of energy in it. Um, and I think that when we think about um, systems of coordination, we should think about the amount of energy, the amount of embodied energy that goes into maintaining them. And but I don't know that, it, that capitalism is the only one that has this problem, because if you look at like the so say, I, I don't want to like tell people how to think about the Soviet Union or these sorts of systems, but if we don't consider it capitalist, which I, I don't consider it these systems capitalist, um, I think there's flaws with them, but they had a lot of um, the same sort of dynamics of um, increasingly requiring embodied energy to go into infrastructure that maintained the system uh, in, a, in an unsustainable way. Um, and so I think that we can use systems approaches and, and to identify where things are actually needed and reduce these. But I, I do think that it's going to be a continual process that like creating socialism won't just solve it for us, that it's going to be a, that there's this sort of natural dynamics that will lead towards a drift towards more and more of these um, sorts of superfluous effort being applied to maintain things. Um, and that will take critical approaches and continual engagement to fight that. Um, but on the um, when you're talking about the capitalist firms, yeah, I mean that's that's part of why I, I definitely I, I study this stuff, and I think you're you're onto something there. But I do think that there's also a, a danger to say um, Leigh Phillips and um, uh, I forget his first name, Rogowski's book, The People's Republic of Walmart, where they just really uncritically, to, and I'm not saying you, you're doing this, but like uncritically take um capitalist forms of planning as like oh well, the capitalists are planning and that proves we can do it too i think that it proves in principle that markets aren't the only way to organize things but markets are actually really important for capitalist forms of planning um because money in particular as a as a universal equivalent allows for dramatically simplifying cost accounting 
And cost accounting is is really like an integral part of the organization of the capitalist firm. Um, the way in which you can um, quantify and compare different business activities and operations um, and determine how to structure them such that you can have improvement and can establish some form of control in the sense of like having coherence at all, not necessarily just like the authoritarian control, but um, well, it's definitely true that capitalist firms do sort of have command economies. There's also since the like 1970s been the sort of alternative push of systems thinkers in, in business. Um, one really interesting one is um, Peter Senge. He wrote this book, The Fit Discipline. And it, 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 these sorts of approaches of like um, breaking out from the sort of rigid control structures. Um, the capitalists, I guess, realized that the sort of command economy model doesn't work. Like it eventually runs into problems um, the longer it runs, you get it, this accumulation of of um, habits and structures that end up becoming like, disconnected from the things they were originally trying to solve, and then you end up like things trying to like processes that get created to solve the problems for the processes that were solving a problem maybe no longer exists. And and so the capitalists in the eighties and the seventies started approaching like, how do we s cut these things out, and so. Senge has these, these five disciplines. There's like systems thinking, personal mastery, um, mental models. So mental models, like thinking about the different approaches and mental views of the world that other, your colleagues have. Um, um, team learning, like how do you create structures in which you can share information and learning across um, your um, organization. So that way it's not just with one person, you don't end up with too much specialization. Um, and like, uh, you see that person leaves, then the organization screwed or whatever. And, and um, so each of, but each of the disciplines that he develops are, are they're kind of simplified ways because managers are very stupid people. Um, and so he takes the sort of um, these broader concepts and distills them in a very straightforward and simple way, which is very helpful. But he draws a lot on um, David Bohm, who is a, a physicist and a Marxist. Um, and David Bohm developed this idea of, of dialogue circles. And so Senge appropriates the sort of Marxist approach to um, how to overcome contradictions, which is also kind of similar to, to Follett um, in some ways, but much more unstructured. Um, and so Senge takes Bohm's dialogue circles and, and imports them into, into businesses like, um, I think he worked for GE, General Electric, um, and a number of other firms. Um, but and so you end up seeing like dialogue circles in a lot of big Fortune 500 companies. And, and what a dialogue circle basically is, is everybody in an area of the organization, regardless of their formal hierarchical status, has is supposed to be formally equal in, the, in this circle. And there's no agenda set and there's no um, sort of business set. And basically people are free to talk about whatever comes to mind. And these sorts of discussions, what they do is they take... Um, implicit knowledge and um, things that don't exist as knowledge in the formal bureaucracy of the company um, and allow them to come surfaced because the senior managers have an idea of the way the world works and an idea of what's happening in the company and they're tracking all these visible metrics but they don't necessarily that that really attenuates and, and limits what they can actually see and so having a dialogue circle um, allows them to appropriate the sort of knowledge and sentiments of the organization as a whole um, and kind of build new knowledge that they can then like met ingest and metabolize into the organization. Um, and so like, it, I don't know, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm framing it kind of cynically, but it it's really interesting, I guess, to me how um, you have these sorts of systems approaches get absorbed into the, the capitalist infrastructure and this, uh, this authoritarian infrastructure in a way that allows a more effective use of resources and, and cognitive resources. Another another one like this is um, this idea of interactive planning that comes from um, Stafford Beer's colleague, Russell Akov. And interactive planning, like Follett's Law of the Situation, brings um, in the subordinate members of a, of, a, of a team to set the priorities rather than leaving that 
as a prerogative of the, of the upper management. Um, and it, with interactive planning, it happens in a sort of pure metal way that almost mimics like Soviets, um, where like the, the you said delegates from like lower level planning committees to the higher um, because uh, structures and they you know bring with them all the experience and discussions of the lower level groups, but it's the higher level planning committees that set the um, agenda as a whole, but someone at the top level planning committee might just be a rank and file employee in the firm. And, and I don't have examples off hands of, of companies that do this, but I, I'm pretty sure there still are some that uh, use his particular model. Um, but anyway, so yes, like capitalist firms are very innovative in, in exploring these sorts of things, but like, I do think it's important to think about how it's not just um, planning in the sense of like command and control that they're implementing, but they're actually implementing like a lot of these tools exist as ways to, um, and these processes exist as ways to gather information and like um, create a social brain, I guess, like in the sort of Marxist sense of a social brain, but like locally for an organization whose goal is profit. Um, where I think in socialism, we want to do something similar, but for different ends. I don't know if that helps. Um, sorry, I was talking for a while. Um, that definitely helps. Thank you. Yeah, it's a really good. I'll, I'll, let, I'll let other people ask, but uh, just on the last point, like, yeah, it does seem like capitalism has a laboratory for which they, it's a flawed laboratory because like you said, there's some path pathological elements of the market that seep into there structure, right? Um, because ultimately they're still trying to maximize shareholder value. So uh, you know, there's a there's a limit to how bottom up these things can be, even though I think they realize that a bottom up approach or like a local, like these dialogue circles approach, it it does access some level. They're tapping into something which is like close to the origin of surplus value, which is our our ability to cooperate as human beings. Um, they know how to tap into that, but ultimately it gets like capped at a certain level. Um, and so like, yeah, I'm, I'm very interested in this idea of like, what is the socialist version of this? Or what is the communist version of, of this type of laboratory for organizational science? Uh, but thank you. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure who was first, whether it was Jay Milley or... or uh... I think Jay. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> Emilia, first off, that was uh, just to clarify, since it, I think it's really helpful and something um, we've been looking to talk about for a while, like th this, this whole discipline has come up multiple times in conversations, um, but we haven't had a chance to really dig into it. So it's, it, I really appreciate um, having this history. Um, and I kind of wanted to ask a question from the perspective of uh, the organizing and kind of how you've been kind of think about this in terms of left-wing organizing because one thing that you said early on that really struck me is is that for the theory of constraints to work you need to establish some kind of minimal threshold of regularity and then then you can kind of start detecting and and doing things with constraints um and one thing we talk about a lot in stp is the idea of like political experimentation where we're trying to kind of create conditions where novelty can emerge and so establishing enough regularity to study constraints and establishing a space for novelty emerge, those seems like two things we, we have to accomplish both. And I'm kind of curious just uh, from your own reading and experience kind of where you stand on, like how we combine those things. Yeah, I mean, those are, I think that's a, that's a really interesting tension there. And I think that part of it is that, um, you can have um meta systems or or meta infrastructure where you can um create spaces in which like it is regularized that we experiment right um there's this i know i'm throwing a lot of references and i'm really sorry about this um but there's this idea called toyota kata it's a book by mike rother um and he deals with so kata comes from a japanese word for like a sort of habit or regularized practice um that you do like in martial arts you know you have a kata so it comes out of this sort of martial arts tradition but um at toyota one of the things they they do is they inculcate um this process of scientific investigation 
into their work process as like a necessary and regularized habit such that they're always experimenting and they're always engaged in this sort of critical thinking rather than having the regularization be about um, routine. The regularization is around disrupting routine. And um, so they have this process called Kaizen in um, Toyota um, and, and Aline. And Kaizen is this idea of a continuous improvement. Um, and so, and they ties in with the, what I mentioned before with, with Kanban and, and manufacturing Kanban is a little different than in, in projects and in, in manufacturing Kanban is you have these buckets um, with the necessary parts for that stage, that, that um, work center. And each bucket has a card that once like the bucket runs out, that card goes to the central supply and then th things resupplied. But um, what they'll do at Toyota is they'll deliberately undersupply or they'll speed up a work process in order to break the work process and figure out where it breaks. Um, because they have this idea that um, the slack and the natural solidarity, I guess, and then using the word loosely of people in work is organized around like, so say there's like um, your, your car has like a, a faulty um, uh, thing that like your, your air conditioning doesn't always come on, but if you whack the right spot, it'll come on. Right. And you can solve it that way. And so you just whack it every time you need to, to whack, to have your air conditioning come on. And in work processes, the same thing will happen. Like say there's a leak or something like people will just tighten the nut or whatever and solve it. What Toyota tries to do is they try and stress the work process out so that way you can't solve the um and they do it in a controlled way they only do this one work unit or they'll do this one section of the working sometimes they'll do the whole plant but so that way that that leaky valve or whatever that if you had screwed the nut it would have solved but you don't have time to screw the nut in so now it breaks and then they can see okay well this broke and then they have a another process it's called the the uh, and on cord where they will have a, a cord across the whole assembly line that any worker who identifies a problem can pull and stop the whole work process um, immediately. Whenever they, if there's a safety issue, if there's a defect, if, and you're actually, part of your job is to, to stop the work process. And then your whole team and any managers around will come and you will jointly try and identify what caused the problem and then do a root cause analysis using like five levels of regression generally um, they call it the five whys to identify like okay well this leak happened because of this nut um being up but why isn't the nut well it's because this machine is vibrating which loosens the nut um why is the machine vibrating well because you know um the um gaskets over here are uh, are thin um and um why are they thin well because they haven't been replaced why haven't they been replaced and then you, you use levels of regression so that way you can solve things at a, at a deeper level and it allows them to continuously improve and develop um new methods for manufacturing one of the things that mike rother talks about in toyota kata is how american companies constantly copy toyota and like their their, their exact physical methods but um, when they go back, like two years later, Toyota's no longer even using the same things that the Americans had just had, had finally implemented and have like a totally different way of say, um, changing out their die casting or, or whatever, um, because they um, don't, it's not about making like this one process more efficient in this one way. It's about identifying how do you um, reduce the capital outlays and like, how do you um, reduce defects through this, yeah, like um, constant process of and not just scientific investigation and, and collaborative scientific investigation, but also mentoring. Um, and they they have this regimented process of each person in their hierarchy of, of their corporate hierarchy is responsible for mentoring and like um, asking questions and observing and um, provoking their subordinates to solve problems um, and like come up with solutions. And even if they say like you have a better solution as a senior Toyota, um, leader or, or manager or whatever, like you actually, you will be reprimanded if you implement your solution rather than having um, your subordinate come up with like their solution, even if it's not as good as yours. Um, because you, they want them to develop their their leaders and, and develop this capacity for, for critical thinking. And so I guess like kind of, that's one way to synthesize these, these competing needs of how do you have regularity 
and how do you have experimentation? And it's partly by making experimentation like an actual formal process itself. Thank you. That was that was awesome. It really helped. Hey, good evening, Amelia. I just want to thank you for your presentation, for sharing so many references. And uh, I apologize. I'm rather sick. I sound like shit right now, but um, <clears throat> oh, sure, done deal. Uh, I'd like to ask, actually, uh, rather just in terms of like a curiosity, perhaps, or maybe like to establish some sort of genealogy. But um, I remember um, it was an author that was like uh, heavily cited in uh, like uh, business management, management science, which was like a churchman, right? Um, West Churchman. And I'd like to know like, where does he fit in all of this? Like, I remember there's a lot of, there's like a line that goes from like um, uh, general systems theory, uh, like how he plays, plays a part in uh, his view of management his view of complexity as a whole, but like, uh, I, there's like, you mentioned the fifth discipline and there it's so easy to go from like, uh, uh you know, just, uh, taking one or two words from system theory and general system theories and that sort of thing, like one or two words from cybernetics and putting in into like a sort of managerial brand, you know, like coming up with something somewhat new, but he has like some intersections with uh quite a few people like through history so i i was wondering where he fits in like uh, uh in in let's say uh going through to to gold rat as you, as you said uh to the other authors you mentioned and so on yeah so, you know, I haven't actually read Churchman myself. I've read, there's a book called Rethinking the Fifth Discipline by um, Robert Louis Flood that does give an overview of some of his work. So I, I can't speak to Churchman's like writing directly. I have a, a few of his books. I just haven't got to him. But um, I do know a bit of his history in that he helped co-found operations research with um, Russell Ackoff, who I mentioned earlier. And I've read a bit of Ackoff. And what I, from what I understand, one of the really interesting things about Churchman was that he, so he developed, so operations research comes out of um, the Second World War and like these sort of innovations that um, the military planning process had developed and how to coordinate activity and how to improve um, supply and manufacturing. And, um, but it became very technical and very focused on like just narrow areas. And, and both Churchman and Akov um, I believe it's church. It might, it might be Checkland. Who anyway? He's the church. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's Churchman. They um, critiqued um, their the operations research and actually kind of reject it, even though they had founded it in favor of these systems approaches of looking at, at the bigger picture, right? Um, and I, yeah, I would need to read um, Churchman directly to to comment too much about his thinking, but. It is interesting how a lot of these people pop up all over the place. And um, you know, like Akov and, and Stafford Beer were close, right? And 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 Akov and, and Churchman being close. Um and also like someone I mentioned before, like Howard Odom, um, I believe both he and Churchman were in the Club of Rome together, you know, um, which is kind of an ill like the so the I think that there's sort of like these areas where there was this nexus that was really big in from the late 1960s through the 1990s of all these um people who had realized there was a crisis in american management um and in european management thinking and it happens about the same time the Soviet Union's declining right so like we have this narrative of america beating the soviet union but part of it is i think only because these this this cadre of like critical people save capitalism from itself right from you know um i don't know like it's kind of a vibe i have but yeah i can't really speak to churchman too much directly i'm sorry thank you so much
Hey, everyone, would, would, it, would everyone be okay just taking a five minute break so we can back and have a second round of debate? Okay, so be right back in five minutes. <laughs> 
we slowly Put my dog in. Um, just with regard to, to Churchman, I do remember in the book that kind of gave a survey of his, his work, I, I do remember that he was very um, philosophical. And so I think that's another interesting thing is that a lot of these um, 1970s systems thinking business people, a lot of them draw on people like Hegel and Kant um, and, and I don't know, it's just, that's kind of an interesting point, I think, that is worth thinking about in that, like, so many of these business theorists are actually, like, practical philosophers, rather than just, like, um, I don't know, pragmatic, hard-nosed types. They're actually, like, really bringing in a lot of high-level academic work that I don't think you really see too much today in the business world. At best, they're usually, like, really smart computer scientists or something. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure if anyone wants to to already jump in and ask something, but I, I had a couple of questions. I just wanted to put them out there. Uh, it's also, I think, an opportunity to, to just compare some of the stuff. I mean, I'm really interested also in really knowing, I mean, I don't think it's the best environment right now, but in time, if we have a chance to continue this conversation, also getting a bit of a sense of how, how you... How the stuff we're, we've been working on kind of appears to you and, and how it compares with some of the stuff you've been investigating. But I mean, just trying to already establish some of those comparisons by means of some questions. Uh, one thing that, that I that I think it's, uh, I wonder how you see it because I think one, one of the themes that also made the concern, I think that the, the, the way you, you, you told this original encounter with Taylor, where it starts as an accusation, when you're just trying to solve clearly a useful problem, and then you need to, you're stuck between this, either you accept this kind of division between knowledges that are interesting and the, the ones that are bourgeois, or you go investigate, but you're crossing a certain line where you're going to have to convince people to bring that information back into organizing as something meaningful. And uh, it's been a while that we've been, we've been and I think this was a big motivation, similar situations were a big motivation for a lot of what we do, this kind of usually internal failures that you can't really put on, on the, you can't really account for them in terms of the influence of some malignant ideal, ideology. It's just a, almost the inverse functioning rather than ideology as the things you accept that you shouldn't, but ideology as the things you reject that you shouldn't, right? A sort of set of a, a kind of a weird monopoly of of ideas uh that you're not allowed to 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 touch on and i think it's a, a nice inverse reading of uh you know the ideas the dominant ideas are ideas of the dominant class perhaps the ideas with the power to be dominant they say they're powerful ideas they are the monopoly of the ruling class sometimes. and uh wh why do i bring this up because i think that there is an interesting kind of political entry door i'm not sure if this is generalizable but at least in some places i feel like it's 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 a way to bring these things back in which is this kind of crisis for example we see in brazil where uh for a while you could expect a certain level of a sort of you know managerial vanguard of parties collectives or whatever people interested in keeping these things going they came from a middle class that was still above water from a certain level of precarity, which is no longer the case. And so this kind of cries of militants who are already complaining, already overworked, already kind of fed up with inefficiency, frustration, and so on, but it didn't really reach a certain level in the organizations. Now, those managers, those organizers, those, those middle cadres, they themselves are in a precarious situation, and they have further motivation to learn how to to find a new compatibility between social reproduction and political transformation. That these things, this is not a given that these two things will find a place in your life. You need to work this out. So I'm not sure if this is a generalizable thing because sometimes, you know, in a lot of, I think you can kind of 
probably build a map of how people get politicized and involved organizing where those singular moments in life where the workload is not that high, you have a, a certain quality of free time that kind of tracks with how people also get involved in a more hands-on way, which is not just task-oriented, but like thinking about organizing in a more kind of holistic way. So one thing is, I, I wonder what you think and, and if you've seen this as an interesting route to bring these things back into organization, places where you have that symptom that, you know, you can't really, it's no longer possible to keep this sort of heroic or romantic dualism between work and militancy, where the tools that you use to think social reproduction, economic life, work environments, and the tools you need to think about usually very morally about militant work and so on. These things cannot be separated anymore. They're clashing and we just get this kind of generalized burnout thing. Clearly people, I mean, this, this is I find in my work, I see this all the time. Uh, it's amazing how much, much more suffering there is in leftist organization than in right-wing organization or uh, because we simply are not allowed or don't think in terms of making these environments breathable. And you just put so much pressure on people. And I mean, it's not just your job. It's something which has like ideals connected to it. So, you know, it's like the perfect, if you just wanted to terrorize somebody with their, you know, monthly quotas, you just associate that with revolution and suddenly like things get really pressured, you know? So it just seems like a interesting ticking bomb in terms of either these things get better absorbed by us and we need to find ways of doing it. Or it's just untenable for certain types of organizations to continue, especially, I think, in urban situations where the, either the specific goals of organizing and the, and the specific kind of group of people who get involved, involved are kind of living in that fringe where they still allow to get certain interests because the quality of life and so on allows them to have that expectation of engagement, but life just hits them in a way that either either you find a way to be more efficacious with your time, you get things done in ways that can be, you know, replicated by others so they don't rely personally on you. I mean, you, you mentioned a couple of times, you know, depersonalization, but it sounds like it's also a crucial term to solve that sort of contradiction, right? So processes can go further than you can go. So my first issue would be to just to, to bring this issue up, which I think gives this kind of a concrete uh, relevance, you know, more than just a general need to, to to bring a kind of more scientific thinking to organizing, but just also the pressing aspect of it in terms of just what happens with organizing in precarious situations. It looks like it makes it even more relevant. You know? Yeah, I mean, I think that, that, that really mirrors, I guess, my and, and people I know's experience with organizing in the US in that, I mean, there, I think that there's still more maybe people who aren't in a precarious position in terms of like being able to like, like have that sort of middle class layer but they tend to be m more liberal here so like in terms of the marxist left i think like it's definitely very become more precarious than in the past but like we still have this huge layer of like progressive activists or whatever who have stable jobs and that sort of thing i think just because the economic situation is is more favorable here um for people in the kind of the imperial core or, or whatever but um yeah i mean it's, it's it's not a solved problem i think but there's a lot of um i think part of th there's there's kind of two different sides to this one is like one that's kind of um maybe dangerous to bring to talk about but maybe as like a, a psych psychotherapist might appeal to you is i think that a lot of people on the left especially who who approach leadership positions often bring like a certain level of like neurosis or something you know um and baggage and like traumas and so like in the ways in which like they try and solve their organizational problems often involve like the personal coping strategies of like you know i'm a good person because i'm doing these things you know um and i think that's something to contend with i don't it's a very tough thing to engage with but um so that's kind of a different side to this but i do think that that's worth surfacing that that i've, I've seen it a lot 
on in, in organizations I've been in where like people bind by bind their identity very tightly in with their role in an organization or the types of practices they engage in. And so being able to address like how do you and and, and I think it was it's helpful that you brought emphasize the depersonalization aspect to what I was talking about before of like how do you make it so um, people aren't threatened by these discussions? How do you, and that's that's something we're thinking about, like creating spaces in which real dialogue can happen and in which you can suspend um, these sorts of things before you enter that space um, cool. and having a commitment to do that. Um, I think that's that's a very helpful thing in, in any organization where like the, you have these sort of like entrenched battle lines and, and things, but like being willing, like, okay, you'll bracket your things and I'll bracket my things and it'll come up with like a free discussion. And, and hopefully in that context, there'll be new types of understanding that are created that will like kind of heal some ties. Um, and I think that's very helpful. Um, and then on the on the flip side, in terms of like, oh, these things are like taboo or like, you know, they aren't, you're not a leftist if you draw on these sources. There's kind of two pieces of maybe advice I could give. One is to plagiarize and just not reference, you know, where it comes from. Um, and just like pretend like some organizer mentor you had came up with it um, or attribute it to Lenin or something. Um because actually also Lenin endorsed Taylorism and stuff. And so did Krupskaya. So you can say, yeah, Krupskaya came up with this, right? Um, but um, on the other, but maybe more like, seriously, I think that you can, you can just emphasize too, like that what we're doing isn't working and bring like emphasizing like these sorts of like, okay, um, what is our goal? And like, thinking through these things um as like in, in a more explicit way of like where are we trying to go what activities are we doing now are these activities um concretely aligned with the goal that we're trying to reach how do we measure that and then coming up with like measurements is very helpful like okay um you know um are we actually getting people to come to our meetings right and like what is that what does engagement look like? How do we actually quantify these things? But there is a danger with, with measurement. Um, and I think that like we're at the point where like, it's better to bend the stick towards it. But um, a really, what kind of the father of a lot of this type of research is this guy, W. Edwards Deming. And he he's actually, so there's a, a quote that's attributed to him all the time. That's a, it's not his quote, but so they say that uh, he, people attribute to him this quote that it's, um, if you can't measure a system, you can't manage it, which the actual quote he had was, there is a costly myth that if you can't measure a system, you can't manage it. It's it's dangerous. Um, and because one of his key ideas is that um, managerial systems are conditioned and um, their behavior is structured by the things that they measure. And um, that if you want to produce different behavior, you measure different things. Um, and so like in a firm, you know, your productivity is measured certain ways. And so that creates certain types of behavior in order to not get punished or whatever. Um, but um, those measurements don't necessarily reflect the actual reality of what you're trying to achieve. And so being really mindful of like that the role of measurement in an organization isn't to actually objectively understand the environment and the process. It's to create a basis for quality, like to, to, to signal or to figure out when you need to do qualitative investigation and also to produce behavior in the environment um, that is hopefully aligned with what you're trying to achieve um because like there are no there are no formal measurements of, of any process except for like really abstract physical processes that like capture the whole thing um and the whole dynamics and so like yeah it's it's even if something looks good on paper it isn't necessarily functioning right or even if it looks you know bad maybe it actually is working um but anyway so i think 
So I think that going into it, like, okay, we need measurements, but also like knowing that and being explicit that like, we need to be able to revise these measurements and we need, and we need to focus on the sort of qualitative aspects that are um, implicit and can't really be measured um, and, and, and foregrounding those. And then figuring out how to have the formal aspects of the organization support those. Because I think on the left, we often overemphasize um, formalization as a kind of like a, a trauma response to the hearing of structuralness, you know? Um, and we like create all these bureaucratic procedures and stuff. But, um, and so when I'm, I, I mentioned like regularization and these sorts of things, but I, it's more like habit and um discipline and like res responsibility and accountability that are important here and then coming up with like ways to like use measurements as a way to do qualitative auditing and like and not giving up on the importance of tacit understanding and experience and 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 those sorts of things i think that's that's really important um that we often go one way or the other it's like it's always oh, all just like my personal experience and i'm this organizer who knows the way to do things and it's my personal network or it's all this bureaucratic process and you really need both um and it's so easy to slip into over one or the other uh, i think you're you're muted i'm uh, sorry yes let me speak by myself uh oh yeah i just want to say like i think this leads very nicely to the second question i wanted to ask that also connects with what dennis uh asked before and also uh, with john uh, because, uh, you know, my impression is that, uh, I mean, you, you mentioned this about, you know, the sort of grain of salt we need to have when we just want to also bring outside of the workplace environment where, you know, for example, uh, gold rats examples are very much based on manufacturing and so on. But when we bring this into like a general kind of, uh, field of organizing, we need to be careful. And I think that uh, the, the question that Dennis brought up, the, the two issues of one is, okay, but these processes are still framed. You, you might not be exchanging with money inside a company, but still be still framed by a goal, which is to make profit. And this is still a take the ultimate cap on how you're gonna, you might bring any tool you want into that environment, but and, and explore all sorts of ways to kind of, uh, decompose and recompose actions and, and, and processes and so on. But there is kind of a basic type, a basic kind of type of port that input and output in a global sense needs to fit into ultimately. And that's gonna frame this whole thing. So you need to be very careful with the idea that, well, you're in an island outside of you know market economy because it's just a, a resolution problem or a scale problem. Yes, you're, you're zooming in at a level where you're not going to see money as a as a as part of circulation but the whole thing is just a big bubble inside of something that's already typed in a certain way right uh, which is also why so much courage goes into using these tools from elsewhere because the goal is so clear that you can afford to change drastically how you measure and pierce kind of kind of parse through this the, the, these actions there because it's very clear so uh there seems to be the general form of this uh problem which i think is what you you named the beginning and the john picked up on which is uh there is some general artificial framing to this which is a, a, something that's going to keep the regularity going that then you will be able to treat organizations as if certain rules or laws or principles or tendencies apply Otherwise, if you're at a previous level where you can't really, and if you take this kind of idea of a type here, just to mean you have a steady way of separating signal from noise and from telling what is meaningful information from what is not, you know, you can still play around with it like crazy. The point that you realize, I don't know, some rank and file guy has really relevant local information. So that's a new type of information you're going to consider, but only because you know how to plug it in back to the bigger uh, story you're interested in, which is a profiting problem. Uh, so this is one thing we've been very interested in, and I wonder, you mentioned it now in, in, a, in, a, in a way that I think is very interesting, which is to say, sure, look at kind of regularity of norms, forms, as a way of bringing this regularity in, but what we mean by it is actually something 
quite layered and complex, which will include tacit knowledge, will include interpersonal relations. It's, it's just a weird mix and you need to be able to separate, I think, a sense of political goal from a sense of, of let's say, relevant metrics, right? And you can't want the two things to coincide too much, nor the goal to disappear completely out of picture, because I think that's the probably, I'm not sure if you agree with this, but that's that seems to be the thing, if, if you know how to, let's say, also have a level of flexibility with that, uh, the thing that you can make concrete in order to make other things disappear from the picture. So the law of the situation, if I understood correctly, has a bit of that feel where you're able to put something into the picture that empties out a bit of that personal, it's almost like the personal is the last kind of resource for you to store a minimal sense of orientation. If you can't store it anywhere else, you're going to store in people's opinions or their values. That that seems like a the worst way to coordinate things or to conciliate things in an organization. So what I'm thinking of first is this, just in general sense, if, if that makes sense, if that's a good way of approaching it. And second, just throw out there something which we've been discussing a lot in the last couple of years, because uh, one thing that has interested us a lot is the idea that uh, just taking this kind of, I'm not sure if you can call it a tradition, but there is a, I mean, a whole bunch of, of Marxist or Marxist inclined thinkers who rather than starting from a sort of stages description of these different modes of, you know, production or exchange or whatever, they try to stack them up and then describe, okay, usually when we organize, there are affinity relations that are contractual or property relations of some kind, and there are economic uh, value relations also broadly understood. But of course, society to society, situation to situation, this can change drastically of what is the dominant thing. To go back to the business kind of workplace discussion, clearly there are the, the management of communitarian ties, affinity relations, property, law, contracts, but ultimately the thing we're focused on is making sure that the value condition is the one that is necessarily respected. Everything else can kind of move around if we could, right? So once you see it in that way, you kind of start uh, looking for, uh, how would you put this, like this, you know, you kind of need to establish regularity in all those levels in some way. Because ultimately coordinating with people will be a way of being able to track where what matters, like where does what difference make a difference, right? Uh, which is not always the same. So it kind of just makes it a nice kind of general theory where it looks like in abstract, you actually always have at least to be very kind of coarse grained about it. You kind of always have a bunch of parameters because if, if, if you know, your personal relations are being preserved. If a sense of kind of property relations are being preserved, uh, again, and that doesn't necessarily mean private property, but anyway, like what is what belongs to whom is being preserved and a sense of uh, the value of things being preserved, you, you actually have this kind of multi-parameter space, which makes it very complex, very hard to know what's going on. And then you have solutions to allow us to coordinate locally. So... For example, once you know profit is the name of the game, when you know that you know you can fuck up in many ways as long as you don't fuck up in this particular way, suddenly, okay, this is manageable, right? So it looks like this is a, a kind of a slightly broader, but still not just, just kind of uh, how I would call it. Like it isn't too underdetermined. You don't start from nothing because everything can count. No, that's not true. Like there are some things we know that tend to count more than others. And then you say, well, if you want to do something which is just not the workplace experience, you need to find ways to keep more than one parameter like that in mind. And they might not align and they might conflict, but you kind of, that's how you, 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 you navigate that. So, I mean, I think that, uh, I mean, I'm, again, guys, interrupt me here or add things because I'm, I'm, I'm trying to simplify to the extreme something that is much more sophisticated than that when, in, in the way we've been using it. But generally, I just wanted to see how, how you see this kind of, this particular problem of, it has on the one hand, the issue of making, you know, using the difference between the measurements we can make in these environments versus the goal, because you want, as you said, the measurements to be 
it's updatable and revisable and so on. But at the same time, uh, this sense that if you want organizations to compose together, if you want them slowly to be able to integrate one another or to relate to one another in their own terms, they must be able to substitute this particular way of porting one into the other, right? Where you know what type of thing needs to come out and, and, and to separate what's meaningful from what is not to something else that's equally tight, like equally recognizable as a, as a shared form, right? Rather than just a matter of flows and rates. Uh, you, so you need to step back into that. So I just, I mean, I'm throwing a lot out there, but I just wanted to hear you uh, a bit more like your thoughts on this, this type of issue. Uh, yeah, sorry, I just said too much in a confusing way. I think I definitely followed what you were saying. There's a lot of different aspects and ways so I could, could approach this um really quickly with, with Paul saw the situation I, I have emphasized that it's depersonal depersonal depersonalizing but she also talks about in in so she has this book create her book creative experience is the book that gets into this but she also describes it as a repersonalization as well um because it, you're also drawing on like the personal experience right in a way that um hierarchical forms of of giving of orders isn't doesn't do where like people become automatons or whatever and so it's depersonalizing in the emotional sense but it, I, I do think it's important to think about how it allows more of the person in the creation of the, the actions that are to be undertaken but in terms of your, your broader thing I think that um Stafford beer is very helpful here um because it the viable system model um is recursive right and so you have um different levels of meta systems in, in the viable systems model. Um, and each uh, meta system has its own meta language, right? Kind of in the formal se the sense of like a formal language and like logic or, um, um, you know, like, and so it'll, and in the, the meta language in the VSM, um, there are kind of encoded a set of uh, goals or values um, and so, like, you know, in a firm, um, because that's Kent Beer is also a managing consultant, um, a typist in the typist pool, they have a set of values and norms that they're trying to um, organize for that aren't necessarily the same as profit. So when we're talking about, like, how there's these different bubbles, you know, in the economy, right, that you mentioned, um, yes, the broad level meta language that firms most firms, not all, most firms are subordinated to a capitalism is is the profit system. But at the lower levels underneath that, each level, a logical level of the organization, they have different types of priorities they're trying to reach. Like, you know, in the individual bureaucrats in charge of these divisions, they're not necessarily trying to maximize profit. They're trying to maximize, say, the size of the portfolio they manage, right? Or they're trying to... Um, show that they're valuable by effort, by creating greater efficiencies in their particular division, um, which correlates and they can justify it to the senior executives and investors based on its role in profit, but they're measuring something else, right? They're, so they're working in it with a different meta language that governs their behavior and the people subordinate to them likewise have their own sorts of like again a car dealership um measures itself yes it measures itself based on profit but it also measures itself based on say um customer satisfaction and these sorts of things that the higher levels only care about in so far as they relate to profit and so they're disciplining the the deal the small business dealer guy that they have with that but he's actually and so he cares about that because that's the level at which he's being controlled but he's actually the language which he would control it. or like i mean if you think about like craftsmen or whatever like they care about their craft they care about like the 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 furniture they're making or whatever and so i think that that when we're thinking about when we're talking about goals and like how do we create this regularity it's worth thinking about um what is the meta language and what is the um what are the priorities and what is the way we can talk about the things that we can talk about um, in the language of the type of organization we're in? Because like a, like a tenant union and a labor union and a political party are measuring their success differently. Um, and they have 
there are things that can't really be talked about um, in the language of that organization and its in its system. Um, and like, because like no formal language or can really can like have you know like with like girdles and completeness theorem right um i mean this is i'm vulgarizing it here but um you can't have a consistent system that is able to talk about all possible truths within that formal uh, system and i think that does apply to ling linguistic systems i think um like tarski kind of demonstrates that like grammatical systems actually fall into the same um process and um i think that organizations have a sort of grammar um in both like verbal language but also um like sort of symbols and um nonverbal forms of communication that exist in them um like um Clausewitz talks about like the grammar of war like war has a specific language that of communication that is spoken in bullets and mortars right um and and so like our political organizations and our social and our and our constructions ha have these two. So I think that we can be very mindful about um, when we're trying to apply this to organizations um, and like establish this regularity. Um, looking at it in terms of like nested systems of okay, yes, yes, our broad goal is, is revolution and getting rid of capitalism, um, and that's the movement level, right? But underneath that it's acceptable that my labor union has a set of priorities and a way of, of, of discussing things and um, needs that are distinct from this political party I'm also in. And, and I can, I can, I can wear these different hats, but um, I think that one of the um, really in great innovations that has maybe, I don't know if it's, I'm not saying, I wouldn't say it's on its course, but has shown certain limits is that the Vanguard party model in that, the, the the vanguard parties created a top level of recursion to which the whole movement in a nation was subordinated to and it allowed for disciplining and co creating a coherence between within the strategy of all the different aspects of the movement ecology um and the problem you run into though is that the central committee of whatever national party you have isn't able to cope with the complexity of the real environment that it's trying to to manage and so figuring out how you can have that top level of okay there's accountability here but without um putting planning down to the lower level like without forcing all planning into that command and control structure at the top um but rather making it so you can have kind of an organic form of coordination planning and having like a body as a, like a guarantor, um, I think it could be a very helpful way to approach it. Um, and then facilitating dialogue and those sorts of things at the lower levels. Um, Follett um, also talks quite a bit about planning in her um, writings. And um, for her, like economic planning, that she, she proposes America becomes an economically planned system. Um, but what she means by that is having like, essentially like it's actually weirdly similar to like fascist italy although she's a liberal and she's not like a fascist but like where you have like representatives from the different stakeholders of at that level of society kind of plan things in like a sort of like class neutral soviet right um and i think that's not that's not something we should propose in our society because like we don't want national you don't want brazil to have a national renewal right that like makes you know um a strong brazil in the world stage that's able to you know effectively dominate the rest of latin america and maybe send the yankees home but like now it's just you know like a regional america or something i don't think that's what we any what you guys want but when you're thinking about like so it, i think this also comes i mean this isn't really this may be a tangent from what you're asking, but this is where I find um, John Boyd, who I've mentioned before, very useful because he emphasizes struggle a lot and conflict because he's a military theorist. And I think that there's sort of um, two sides to this. You have your friends and you have your enemies and you need to know which are which. And with your friends, the sort of like systems integrative approach is appropriate. But with your enemies, um, you need to look at like disruption and like how to um 
be able to unglue and tear apart and disrupt the ability for your opponents to have the sort of integration that naturally occurs. I mean, the things we're talking about, we naturally do them. Um, you know, we naturally like have intuition or whatever that is actually our brain, like having processed all this stuff and being like telling you, okay, there's something wrong here or there's some, oh, I should do this. Or, um, you know, you have these sorts of um, people make up after having a fight with their friends and they talk it out. And we, these sorts of things naturally happen. So when we're talking about this in this formalized sense, um, it, it it's not like, this has never happened before. This is like the new solution or something. Like these are really organic things. And so our enemies do these things too. Some of them explicitly and sometimes just naturally. And so I think it's also helpful to, to flip this as well and think about how can we make it so um, the, the far right and, and so on are disrupted and how can we discredit them or how can we um, um cause chaos in their organizations by putting pressure in ways they don't expect um and that identifying like the process like their regularization and their workflow and like what are the weak points there that we put stress on and i think that's also a really helpful way to frame this too um mm -hmm. but yeah that would make some sense uh guys i'm going off here just because i was writing so much while, while amelia was speaking but if anyone has a question please just just jump in I'm just going to take this as a, as a, as a please go on <laughs> silent agreement. So because I had, I had a third question, which I think relates to something else, but that is again connected with, with where we left off, which is one thing that I, that I just also wanted to hear more about because you went into the thing that, uh, yes, th this is where I think problems become clear because I don't think you can. Uh, the two, the, I'd say like these three things go together. The first is there is a, I'd say there is a renewed perhaps, or, or a kind of a, a, a new reason to focus on a, a bringing in, a learning to see, to affect this perspective shift where we, we want to look at our own organizations from, again, as, as the objects of, serious political inquiry that brings management theory and so on into, into there. Uh, but the other aspect of learning to take this shift and looking at organizations as something that's worthy of thinking through how to design them and so on, is also learning how to see one organization in the context of many organizations. I think this, this thing you just mentioned about sort of uh, diversity of strategy as a, you know, when thinking about movement goals, not really being identified with any particular organization's reproduction, but actually the reproduction and kind of ultimate vec some vector of this whole ecosystem kind of thing, right? There is something about, let's say, the external conditions of organizing in the sense that you, you can concern yourself not only with becoming effective at a certain task, but also becoming more amenable to composition. I mean, which doesn't mean agreeing on every topic, doesn't mean agreeing on strategy even. As you said, we, there's enough tools to go around to also include in that perspective shift where you suddenly look at your organization as something that the form it takes will affect, you know, how militancy and, and works and the goals we can take, but it also affects, you can make it easier for things to get composed together and so on. But that leads to the third level, which is then the question I wanted to ask, because once you get organizations composing together for a kind of dispersed kind of common goal, which is not even necessarily any one's particular goal, we start looking very similar to something one could call an economy, but now with a parameter which is not just, you know, maximizing this one uh, metric that actually will guarantee that we're all on the same page. And I, I wanted to know if you think that there is a you mentioned two kind of discussing bourgeois versus proletarian organizational science. I think you you mentioned uh, the first kind of division to be that uh, kind of bourgeois organizational science tends to focus too much on optimizing local locally because it already has the global form. It already knows what is the thing it wants to pay attention to globally. Whereas we don't know what is the global thing. We might even know lo locally, 
what we're interested in, but we don't know how to make those local interests cohere globally in a decentralized way. And often I see this question posed at the level of production, reproduction, and consumption of planned economies, because then, yes, we're dealing with global coherence of you know something else other than capitalism. But it it is actually the same question as diverse diversity of strategies, but just just not focused on you know when you don't have let's say uh, kind of survival interdependence where these organizations are actually producing things that one another needs, but there seems to be a kind of a continuity there at some weird level. And I wanted to hear more from him about that because I have the impression, I'm not sure if, if I got it right, but for, just from some of your comments, uh, that there that there is something different about approaching what is usually conceived as purely political economic grounds and just discussing value economically as if it's just this kind of autom auto uh, autonomous realm of a form that just reproduces itself and we're just latching onto it from this from the fact that ultimately value almost universally exists as a concern for people who are stitching together this productive unit with very little existence at the level of something you could call it circulation, right? Rather than this flat space that everything is latched onto and exists by itself. So it looks like the organizational point of view on the economy is also different, you know? So I just wanted to hear you speak about a, a, a bit more about that because I feel like it also facilitates a continuity. Like it might make the transition that they look different if you start finding some questions which are we are used to pose at the level of economic planning already at the level of political composition, you know? Yeah, I think that I mean, there, there's a couple aspects here. I, I do want to get let Victor um, ask their, their question soon, but um, I just want to respond to this quickly. Um, I think that in terms of... So there's um, one thing that I think is important when you're thinking about like how do you create coherence at the broader level when you don't have you know the universal equivalent of money, right? And when you don't have this sort of thing, um, I think that there's ultimately either way, you're still, you still have resources, right? When you're, when you're not trying to subordinate things to profit, there still are concrete things that, um, the, the reason why you organize in a higher level isn't to do it for its own sake. The reason you organize in a higher level is because the activities you're doing locally, um, run into conflicts that are avoidable um, with other organizations at the same level. Otherwise, why would you organize, like, except just to feel good about it, right? The reason, the, the practical reason, and the reason it emerges at higher levels of organization is because these um, organizations are, are maximizing the, like the, what they're trying to do. And there are preventable um, conflicts that were certain rules in place and guaranteed or enforced, it would not undermine reaching my goal or my lower level goal or their lower level goal. Um, and so we establish some sort of body above us in order to um, in, in enforce these sorts of rules um, for, for our organization's behavior, our personal behavior. And, um, and it prevents what like beer calls like oscillation right where you have like wild swings and in like oh, I, I i can't do my thing now because this person took the, the the spot i needed or whatever um but and so when we're thinking about coordinating the a movement and the, the way in which these high level organizations are able to enforce their will or will they're able to ensure this coherence is by holding resources um which the lower level bodies need that the reason why the common turn the third international was able to um discipline national level parties was because they provided funding and um legitimacy and these sorts of resources and so they are able to purge the leaders of these parties even though they were the leader of you know whatever national party the party had to submit to the common turn because the common turn could withdraw funding withdraw recognition 
and isolate the party. And so that was um, an existential threat to being a, an official communist party to lose the official recognition of the Comintern, right? And um, so there's sort of this resource bargain that emerges um, in which lower level bodies in a movement or an organization agree to carry out the tasks um, one way or another of the higher level coordinating body in exchange for being enabled to to exist and to, or to do their thing or to, to do their thing better like you know obviously like you'll solve like a conglomerate company can spin off its parts like sometimes they have enough resources they can survive on their own but it would be undesirable to do that so they're you know the management of the s- subsidiary still obeys the, the, the more senior leaders um and i think that's a true structure that exists anytime you have a real effective organization um, or in coordination whether it's a sort of like egalitarian and cooperative way that you know i've been maybe advocating or describing here as an alternative to authoritarian methods but at the end of the day um unless you have a stick um and a way to to discipline like that subordinate organizations um and and ensure that like they do what they say they're going to do and not violate the rules you don't have an organization, you know, um, like you have to be able to expel members of your party if they violate the code of conduct, you know, and you have to be able to um, have something that people the, want in order to associate with, with your coordinating body. And so when we're thinking about like, how do we coordinate the, the movement as a whole um, in without money, I think you still have to think about it in terms of um maybe in-kind calculation right or like um resources that um you're able to bring to the table as a as a cohered um broader structure that are worthwhile for and so if you meaningfully want to um establish something like you're gonna need the groups who agree to join together if you don't want them just to split apart you're gonna have to get them to sacrifice some level of resources that the higher level body now controls that make it so they want to like it, you know it's like um like, like in in in, pre- in medieval societies it was very common to exchange hostages to in, in order to ensure a treaty was a was upheld like you would the children of the, the noble would, would would swap and both parties would be able to kill the other person's ch- children i'm not saying like literally exchange hostages but that sort of like i will lose something meaningful to me if I don't follow the agreed upon rules that we have reached um, is very important. Anyway, um, so Victor. Yeah, yeah. okay, uh, thanks for the presentation. And I, I had a question uh, more about uh, the, the Stealing Fire from the Gods text, uh, mm-hmm. uh, Organizing for Power, Stealing Fire from the Gods. It's a test you wrote in t- 2019 about Taylor. I don't know if you remember, but uh, th- there was uh, like a, uh, you described the process in which Taylorism like legitimized itself as a, like a more efficient form of management. And then you compare that to like militant organization that like uses the methods of rule of thumb. And, and I was thinking like, if you try to apply the process that Taylor used to like to prove that it was more efficient doing that rather than what was being done before. I think at the first step, the political organization implodes because when you do that, usually like the leader that is the is threatened and the I, I, and my question was why do you think like it's not like we should emulate exactly what Taylor did, but why did capitalists why do capitalists have like more resilience to change in in like that than our organizations it's like is it is it a matter of structure or composition or maybe uh, uh, the way people think about it maybe you can change it if the, the ideology changes or maybe uh, that that was like my what else yeah, think. that's a really interesting question. Um, I, I, I'm thinking about that, and I think that there's a, there's a few few aspects here. One is that 
it's less so now, but it was at different points, capitalism were like this, but there is a certain level of like the market is sort of like a Darwinian, like cruel, like process, like process where like, you know, it's not, there is planning and, and national level coordination, but like you can r fail or succeed in the market in a, and it's like people have this existential fear of like being left behind or um, being out competed. And I think that like you, you can kind of see actually similar things to the Taylor model in like, a lot of Leninist sects actually um, often when like, especially the, the, the parts that I find more repugnant, like the more command and control aspects um, when they're compete, And then it happens more when they're competing as other Leninist sects you know for leadership and so they start to like introduce more formal structures and more like control over their own members because they want to win leadership and want to get more members versus other leninist sects yeah i saw this in um we had like a fight for the minimum wage in the city of tacoma washington and um this trotskyist group that was there um and then this um sort of more moderate marxist leninist group and then our group which was mostly marxist leninist um i wasn't like we wouldn't have like a set sort of ideology, but we had a lot of Marxist Leninists in our group. And we all got more and more formalized as this fight for 15 process continued, both because the work was harder and like the fight against the enemy enemy was harder, but also because like there was like weird bureaucratic maneuvering over who controlled what committee and stuff like that. And so like these sorts of things like became more intensified. But I think that with, with the capitalists, um, there's that there's that aspect of that okay they're threatened by dissolution and losing all their shit if they don't adopt these things but on the other side one interesting thing about the history of, of bethlehem steel when taylor was implementing it is actually the senior management um was threatened by what he was doing and um because one of the things that he was trying to to do was like he wanted to um have workers who didn't reach a certain level of efficiency either get reassigned or fired right um and the senior managers at the firm didn't like this because what it did was um it was those workers you company housing and like had this like really predatory like real estate uh, like sales arrangements where like the company was making more money by having these workers um who were inefficient work there and get a paycheck and then have to live in company housing that would pay them the, the rent to own process and like getting them on the backside. And so Taylor having like implementing the thing all of a sudden now these workers get fired and now they don't live there anymore. They have no reason to be a part of this like horrible scheme that's preying on them. Um, undermine the senior <laughs> managers like goals. Um, but they were also, you know, resistant to change. And, and I think that um, there's this, uh, this really amazing um text um about mary van cleek um who was a taylorist socialist and she and walter polakoff who i mentioned went into the labor unions and introduced like taylorist um methods of, of um analysis for the unions um to analyze the work process they are engaged in for safety and also like um like purposes and, and um to give them a means to critique work and 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 use these work study methods and like the stopwatch methods and stuff in order to structure the collective bargaining agreements with their employers and um so they would like have like tailorist labor engineers come in and like measure the work on behalf of the union and then that would brought to the um management and the management was in this had the double binds where on the one hand they have agreed that these methods are how we determine how work works, right? That this is true, that these scientific methods are how to structure work. On the other side, it was like threatening their ability to manage and actually make decisions because now the union's coming in and saying, this is how work has to happen. Um, and it's made me more efficient and reduces accidents and you have these commitments to these things. Um, and so you ended up having a rebellion by capitalist management against Taylorism um, in defense of the right to manage. And so you really start to see Taylorism fall out of favor in the um, 1930s as the Taylorists become more militant and start to advocate for a planned economy and start to openly admire the Soviet Union um, in their in their journals um, and say that we need this here. And so like there's a sort of like and that's sort of when human relations and, and 
HR and like human resources start to become a really big thing in capitalism as a way to manage the workforce um, and really take off because they start to, the sort of objective analysis um, gets turned against them. And so when we're talking about like leftist organizers, leaders being feeling threatened, I think that the capitalist managers also have that problem too. Um, and and so um, it really, it, 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 a lot of it has to do with like, where is the the the, the power coming from for the, the person who's the decision maker? Like for a lot of leftist organizers, a lot of it has, you have like what your stuff comes from personal validation and like feeling good about what you're doing or or whatever especially when you're middle class as a labor organizer or whatever like you're not doing it because you're actually from a working class background you're doing it because you want to be a good person or whatever um for, for those kind of people and so they feel threatened and i think the managers who feel that way are often overruled by their like higher level bosses and they don't feel that but as soon as those the people with the actual power in the capitalist firm start to feel that threat um they'll turn on it too so it's not just it's not just us who have the problem um somebody else had their hand raised um and i i might have talked too long i'm sorry about that i think it was dennis oh yeah i i put it down because i, I have to go pretty soon but um i i guess since we have we have a few minutes. Um, I can ask my question. Yeah, I had to do earlier uh, with the topic about uh, global coordination and the universal equivalent. And uh, it seems to me like we have this uh, problem of, of it, you know, it, it's hard to conceive of global coordination without some kind of universal equivalent. And it's just a matter of like replacing money with something else, some other, you know, measure. Um, I don't know if, if, you know, just to put it really simply, like, do you see that as, as an issue that we need to address? I mean, it seems potentially pretty far off before we need to, uh, before we have such levels of coordination required, but um, maybe we can, we can do away with that by just, you know, considering local coordination problems for a long time and then but at some point, it seems like that that'll be an issue, right? Like global coordination um, implies, like you were saying, if, if you have this way of disciplining subsystems where you can like kick out someone from your organization at the global level, then you need some way to justify that, right? Um, for for a capitalist environment, you can justify, you know. Uh, a company, you know, kicking a company out basically by, you know, the company fails and it's competitive metrics. Like it doesn't, it doesn't produce enough profit. So the investors don't put money into it and it falls. But at the same time you have, you know, like the phenomenon of, you know, too big to fail. Some, some companies, even if they miss all the metrics, um, they still are kept alive because they're so integral to the system as a whole. Um, so you have this whole set of problematics about like how to measure what is crucial to the system, which seems to still require one set of metrics or some way of uh, collating disparate sets of metrics into like one universal set. Um, yeah, so I was just wondering what you what you thought about that. I think that that's um, I mean that's really the problem with planning ultimately but um i think that with um it the problem isn't so much having metrics it's that with with capitalism it's that you know everything is subordinated to one and so uh, i think that you need to have multiple constraints and measurements that you're that you're you're observing and then focusing on the one in which performance is the worst is kind of the measure that the way in which you can focus and and create a focusing measure that profit currently serves and that's my that's my kind of intuition i mean i i haven't run a global economy yet um but um i think that so like ha like for example like um carbon emissions are something you could measure right and so currently firms are not um rewarded or punished based on their carbon emissions, the best thing that capitalism can do is um, create like carbon credits and, and so price carbon, right, within the, the pricing measure. But there are things that are really tough to measure 
um, like, I don't know, like actually measuring workplace satisfaction or actually measuring health. Like what does health mean? Right. Um, but you can develop like measurements that correlate to these things. Like you can measure like life expectancy or, or infant mortality. Right. Um, and so when you're measuring the performance of um, like an economic organization or something, you can take these measures and, and use them as a basis for auditing. Um, and, but I think that at some level you need really like democracy and it's like um, you need to have like actual political or, or social um, management of these things, because part of the problem of capitalism is that we give up our control and like our rational organization of society in favor of optimizing for this sort of like blind logic or whatever. Um, and, and, and for this, this measurement that loosely corresponds to, you know, our ability, like our, our, our labor capacity or, or the capacity to, to do work or whatever. Um, and I think that like, so bringing in like actual deliberative social control is one aspect um, to this, and, and that's really messy. But that 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 is necessary to allow the qualitative and um, it, implicit sorts of aspects that are very very hard to actually measure um, to come in, and having and, and being very mindful of that. But then also having like several different measurements that you're measuring on um, in terms of formal measures. Um, and but at the same time like there the, maybe not to contradict myself but there's a danger in uh, if you give people too many degrees of freedom they'll just like whether you're trying to reward or punish it'll be just based on whichever ones like if they you measure someone on 10 metrics and they do well on six of them but really poorly on four like it, does that mean they're doing good or they're doing bad right um it just depends it's very subjective um and so i think that you really have to have a, a sort of dynamic and, and sensitive um, uh, approach to this, where um, when you're looking at the global economy, um, you're looking at um, like if people fall below certain thresholds on on metrics, well, then that triggers, you know, a need for um, central authority or whatever to come in and an audit and um, bring to light problems um and, and i think that when we we're thinking about these formal measurements and these formal structures a, a lot of it like in in western management and western organization including on the left we often try to substitute these formal structures for um and like like money we try to substitute these things for other things but um i think part of the the problem of communism or the the, the thing of communism is really going to be how do we tr treat these formalizations as what they are, which is like, as tools, as abstractions, and and use them effectively um, without having them allied or obscure or erase the reality they're trying to measure? Yeah, I, I totally agree. I mean, I think I think there's a lot of pitfalls with relying too much on measurement, which you, you've already pointed out. Um, and then, yeah, like. I think, yeah, some process of democracy or something, some process of, of deciding what's, you know, the the most justified set of things to measure, which may change over time, which may change depending on the, like in a climate crisis, you know, carbon emissions may be the most, uh, you know, most uh, pertinent measure. And so that's not going to be decided by one thing right, which money is currently, it's just self-reinforcing as always the ultimate arbiter of every decision. Um, but to have some other governing body that can choose different metrics depending on the situation, that's already like a step forward. If I can, just jump, in, if I can just jump in, I think on what Dennis said, because we're also having this discussion in parallel because of some stuff we're working on. Uh, Dennis and I, we've been working with with a, a, a friend of ours and, and on kind of formal models for, for some stuff we're interested in, in value theory and so on. And it's always this discussion about what is the thing you're trying to model exactly? Because one approach to this, which we don't like very much or we've been distrustful of, is people who think that you have a theory of how 
production processes in the most general sense work, capitalist processes are a subcase of those. So you need to start with a process, a theory of process, uh, which is different from actually, let's say, modeling how value, what are the logical properties of value? And then, I mean, it will latch on to whatever it can latch on. And it just so happens you can show that for, for a very fortunate and unfortunate reason, value is very amenable. It's very, let's say, it resonates very well with material processes in a way that property logic and, you know, gift economy don't. Gift economy is very contradictory and in a way that matter is not, you know, matter is very fuzzy and which is a totally different logic and value is very good for fuzzy stuff. So it makes sense that it will latch onto that. So we've been, part of that discussion is also, is, uh, is a sort of, uh, how to put this, is this sort of uh, facility of depersonalizing and connecting parts of social life, is that a property of value? Meaning, uh, yes, in some sense, there is a long history of discussing that, you know, when you, when you put money into, into play in things, it seems to be much easier to keep a certain personal relation, and that's something to, to, to think about. How important that is into creating global supply chains and just general, you know, possibility of integrating such a big world into the same kind of economic system. But more and more, we've been, I think, this learning to be a bit more distrustful of the appearance that there that this coherence is one for free or it's just a freebie you get because things take on the form of value, whereas. What we're looking at most of the time is just the amount of very costly work that it takes to keep things in that form and to and, and, and how much of people's labor just goes into making sure these little parts actually cohere minimally. So when once you look at things in that way, which I, I kind of uh, I, I I think it's it's something we're learning from what we think a technological point of view brings to the table, which is a very counterintuitive idea that's something that looks very small in a way, which is starting from the organizational point of view, actually is a much more general framework than the economic point of view. Uh, but once you accept that, if, that hypothesis, it suddenly looks like, you know, discussing a global socialist economy or, or a large scale socialist transition it doesn't need to solve a problem of global coordination because putting it in those terms is already assuming that people don't every day solve these coordinating tasks. And that's part of what you know economic life is. So you don't need to solve that because people solve that all the time. That's what we do, right? So you, you, you can't count on that when you think about these things in large scale. So I wonder what, what you think about that because uh, I feel sometimes, it, you know, I, I, I was hearing Dennis talk about this and it just reminded me of this. This is something with a long time ago, we, we came across this idea, it's this mathematical idea of how to cut infinite sets and you get this big partition between a way of filtering this huge uh, universes based on, let's say, finding that kind of common part that all parts will share, which is called like having a kind of principle filtering. It will have one minimal element that all parts have with that part. And having this other way of parsing this big spaces, which are, allow you, and, and it can be proved that it's possible, uh, to parse them out by what's called a non-principle ultra filter, where you don't need to have an agreement on a common part in order to, to kind of dissect all these things into smaller parts. They can agree partially on different things and you never really get to have that common filter to everything. And when we were studying this, I realized that I never really thought about it, that there are decentralized forms, but that they have a common form. And you have decentralized forms that have multiple forms. And those two things are, money is actually centralizing in that way. It's a decentralized central thing. Uh, but on the one hand, formally, you don't need to assume that that's the end-all 
of global coordination because you can glue together parts of the world that only agree partially with each other. That's formally possible. And it matches actually something people need to do all the time, which is if the, that hypothesis I mentioned makes sense, you know, that actually a part, a big part of economic life is almost, has almost epistemic value of spinning around whatever it is that you produce, whatever it is that you consume in such a way that it will actually fit into whatever else is, everyone else is doing around you, you know? So I just wonder how, how you see this also, because I feel like there is something about the issue of socialist calculation, economic planning, literature. I know, I mean, uh, uh, NURAT has a lot of stuff on like this multi-parameter kind of thing that already goes in that direction of, you know, the good political part is having many parameters and not having a transcendental reason to decide this or that way. That's what makes it political and free, right? So I just wonder how you see this type of thing then. And yeah. Um, let me click that link. Um, yeah, I think that, I mean, the, the two different approaches you're talking about, um, I definitely see a similar tension in between like a, a sort of loose group i'm uh, associated with mostly th through cosmonaut but also there's pe so there's a, there's a, a group called sibcom in in spain that have people kind of in, in two broad camps and um one is aligned with um paul cockshot's um models of economic planning which really emphasize labor time calculation as a means to establish kind of this sort of coherence, right? Where everything is calculated on that basis and you can modify things, right? You can you can have the planners adjust pricing, uh, labor time pricing based on like political priorities or whatever. Cockshot's very big on um, democracy through um, sortition, right? Like um, lotteries picking who's in, in charge, I guess, um, and, um, and setting these priorities. But, he's, but it's really important for Cockshot's model to have labor time calculation as this basis for which you can both um, get a handle on the the costing and the organization of, of materials and then also to regulate consumption right um, and I'm not I'm, I'm I'm very critical of of this approach um, myself and, and and you know drawing on, on Neurath but also Stafford beer's work on planning and I think that um when you're talking about systems that are organized on the basis of like, okay, they all have this one thing in common. They all can connect through money. It's kind of like this um, interface or, that they all share or um, maybe systems that like these two connect, but then this one doesn't connect with the other one that connects like, like a and a and B um, connect um, and C and a connect, but B and C don't connect um, through these, these, pro these things. I think that, they're both like valid ways of organizing um and uh structures and I, I i don't think that um like you need to go like only have uh, like i say one of them in, in a global socialist economy because like even in capitalism you know we have communities and meaningfully economic sorts of arrangements that are not money-based right like you have communes or whatever right in the woods you know or you have um, patriarchal families that don't measure their resources in money terms they are subordinated to the money economy but internally they don't they don't use that and so the relations between their members aren't necessarily measured in money sometimes they are and that's a pretty shitty family situation to be in but um i think we can we can think about um like how do we establish um you know this coherence and I think that the the issue is like you really have to be somehow have a culture in which the people who have the ability to intervene and make changes um one are incentivized to do so but also um are have the the st structures so that they're really engaged in the living or the the dynamic and and changing um flows of the economy because i think one of the the real the problems with money and also the problems with um soviet style economics and these sort of highly centralizing systems is that 
they go out of sync with the the dynamic needs and um outcomes that they themselves are producing like they're changing their environment but then there ends up being this kind of contradiction or a mismatch between um what they're doing and what has to happen um and so um yeah i guess like having like to me what, what's what's more important than a universal or a measurement is having like real-time monitoring and um active intervention um in the economy um and like having and focusing on the ways in which information flows um and like the the models of the way things are going are updated and like having like having projections of like what different types of activities will do and like how those decisions will affect things and then like in having lots of competing models but like but working based on the more probable ones um does that does that make sense like so rather than focusing on like um having like how things can interface directly having to be attenuated to like one thing or they all have the same in common focusing on like planning as a real-time process at every level of the economy and um I guess, in which can mean like everybody shares these things in common. Uh, if that makes sense in terms of the costs for doing so, um, because like you know, like it's say in in software or something, it might make sense to have a standard in in some way. Like it makes sense to have standard internet protocols, um, but and everybody has to use those in order to interface with the internet. But the, and those are kind of but you could, in theory, make your own internet with a different set of protocols. Like China, like Oregon, China, I've heard about them, like academics and, and policy people talking about making like a new sort of DNS servers that are different than the ones we have in the West, right? Um, they don't aren't doing that now, but like they, they could. And, and so like, you, you don't necessarily have to do it all the same way, but uh, but we do because it's just there's already a sunk cost and it's more efficient to keep doing that way but in, in some cases like you mentioned there's a certain cost to maintaining this these sorts of um coherences or these sorts of attenuations and it's just really important i think to be able to like recognize when um you're putting too much energy in for what you're getting out and having and coming up with a way to measure that um, you know, like, like you all want, you want all the train tracks to be, have the same train, the same gauge, but mm -hmm. it really doesn't matter if everybody like has the same source of break room or something. I don't know. Yeah, no, I see what you mean. And I also think that there is a nice kind of underlying idea also that, you know, the thing you mentioned before with that, that text you, you, you sent us about uh, the guard labor, it's an interesting kind of transition where a kind of guard labor moves to sort of planning labor, you could imagine, right? I mean, it wouldn't be, I mean, you could imagine like substantial resources going into having planning and auditing capacity at every level. I mean, that's for the amount of stuff that go, I think the, the, the point is that if you get the sense of, if you if you decom decompose the idea of economy and, and labor, which is not the same to say you dismiss it, but once you try to get a perspective where these things are a particular kind of point of view on a very messy kind of uh, process, right, of constantly recoordinating these things, and you and it, these kind of key points of you know it just takes a lot of effort, and people are actually uh, willing to spend a lot of money to make sure that things are kept within a certain uh, you know it's not even the, the, the sense of People are not even, these things don't even guarantee that things are within a certain level in a agreed metric. It's just the underlying work of keeping things within recognizable metrics to start with, right? So that it, this kind of condition of possibility is already in, uh, built into you know, things that make the, the economy work. You could just imagine, okay, uh, it's, it makes sense to imagine that a lot of, of resources would go into simply making sure we have enough kind of 
reflexive power at every instant too, right? I mean, so we can decide if, it, if some things would be just rational to keep very standardized, other things, it doesn't matter. I mean, you don't need to have that answer. It's different, let's say, constructing something with that answer in mind and constructing something so that that answer can appear at different places in different ways, I think. So there's a, a uh, Stafford Beer has this interesting idea that uh, freedom is a, it's actually a computable function. Um, and he, he argues that, um, you know, each person um, gets uh, freedom of action, like in inverse proportion to the size of the entire organizational tree. And so, um, and in relation to like their ability to achieve the, the purpose of the organization. And so, um it kind of maybe like harkens to like Hegel or whatever of like freedom as that recognition of necessity and like in achieving like these higher level objectives or or you know achieving mm -hmm. self knowledge or whatever. But I think that like there's this idea that um like the less attenuation, the less constraint mm -hmm. you have, um, the better. But to the point that you do need a, a, a given amount in order to have any kind of coherence. And so like, how do you negotiate that? I think that's a, that's a really tough problem, but I think starting from the perspective that um, we only make rules um, when um, there's a clear um, probability that if we don't have this rule, um, there'll be a problem, you know? Um, I think that that's a that's a very healthy way to, to start these because you really don't want to overburden people with um and like rules end up getting created for their own sake because like so like you introduce a rule and that like in a way that you don't expect will like generate something breaking somewhere else and so then you need a new rule to fix that and so you end up with this exploding like energy inputs required to to keep fixing and, and patching over and like you know putting fingers in the dam or the fish tank or whatever you know to keep pat the, um as like the the tension grows and grows um and when you could have just like not had that rule in the first place or you could have addressed it in a different way in a uh, in a simpler um or way i guess um I, so i think that you know that sort of Taoist thing of like um act without acting or whatever like you know tr trying to reduce the amount of energetic overhead is very important yeah That's very interesting. Uh, look, I think most people had to leave. I know every, I'm not sure if you had a chance to see on the chat. Everyone was thanking you so much for, for everything. I, I totally agree. It was uh, such a great conversation. I mean, I wonder also if there's any chance we can you know, make this into a more lasting kind of uh, conversation. Of course, we don't want to burden you with you know uh, stuff. But first of all, feel free to join us anytime you want if you're bored at home and once just the, you know we meet at this time every week uh there's a lot of stuff happening the next couple of, of months so always welcome uh but also i mean i think that uh, if you're up for it you, you send us so many interesting references it's possible that as we search through them we just might contact you again see if, if, if you'd be interested in debating them with us as well yeah, thank you for, so much for having me. It, it's been a real pleasure, and and, and I've definitely had yeah, some very thought provoking questions, um, and things that I'm going to follow up on. And I appreciate the links you sent as well. Um, very helpful. I actually do have to get going myself. I'm actually sure, like ten sure. minutes before our meeting, so. Um, no, 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 go, go, go. It, it was such a pleasure, and as I said, uh, we recorded it, but you can let us know afterwards how you feel about it. If you want us to make it public or just keep it in house, we can just discuss it afterwards. Thank you so much. Bye. Okay. It's a pleasure. See you all, guys. Bye-bye.